Hey, welcome to Socialism for All. This file is being recorded for the September 2023 edition of Socialism for All. And in it, we are continuing our reading of Lavender and Red by Leslie Feinberg, posted at the Workers' World Party website, workers.org. Their articles are copyright 1995 to 2011, and they have allowed for verbatim copying and distribution as long as that message is noted. So thanks to the Workers' World Party for hosting this series of articles, written 2004 to 2008, again by Leslie Feinberg. We're going to pick it up with article number seven, The Roots of Russian, quote, Homosexual Subculture. Revolutions against feudalism and capitalism in Russia illuminated the nexus of the battles for the liberation of sexuality, particularly same-sex love, the abolition of sex and gender restrictions, and the emancipation of women. These seemingly divergent struggles were up against institutionalized common obstacles. The economic unit for both peasants and workers was the oppressive patriarchal family, whether feudal or capitalist. The superstructure of law, religion, politics, and education functioned to justify the inequality of a class-divided economic base. And this economic and social injustice was enforced by the state machinery of repression. Russian capitalism created an exploited economic class that was up against these common enemies at every turn, and was forced to take on the Amazonian task of battling class rule, its ideology, and its state. Of course, women as a whole were easily visible in pre-revolutionary Russian society. They were not a closeted population. But it took the growth of capitalist industrialization to create a homosexual, quote, subculture in Russia. As early as the 1870s, historian Dan Healy describes that, quote, as Russian cities expanded and commerce and industry grew, a new homosexual identity appeared alongside more traditional relations, unquote. Forensic doctors and others referred to these men as tetki. The word literally means auntie, Healy explains, but it can be translated as queen. Tetka was a patronizing word used for any woman older than the speaker. The little homosexual world, became a feature of Russia's largest cities, Healy says. The abolition of feudal serfdom in 1861 and the demand for wage labor created by industrialization drew large numbers of peasants to the growing cities in search of paid work. It was this centrifugal force of capitalism in Russia that centralized an urban industrial class in the 1880s and 1890s, in which a homosexual subculture took root. Healy writes that, as this subculture in large cities like St. Petersburg and Moscow began to grow in size and complexity. At the end of the 19th century, quote, it developed its own geographies of sexualized streetscapes, its rituals of contact and socialization, its signals and gestures, and its own fraternal language. In these rituals, gestures, and language, the subculture elaborated roles for participants, often based on the principles of the market in male sex, unquote. At the same time, capitalist market relations stamped their own trademark on sexual relations. Quote, this pattern of relations marked a distinct break from older, patriarchal forms of male sexuality, for encounters took place beyond the patron-client nexus of the householder workshop, Healy continues. Quote, now a marketplace evolved with a new hierarchy of values and a new symbolic order. Indeed, capitalists were now taking the Russian Tetka and his friends seriously, running bathhouses, bars, and balls of woman haters that catered discreetly to this clientele, unquote. Healy adds, quote, female homosexuals, as Russian psychiatrists tended to call certain women who had sex with women, appeared in more scattered locations, often off the public stage in the 1890s, unquote. The weight of the patriarchal family. Women bore the brunt of the burden of the patriarchal family structure in feudal Russia. Quote, Russian peasant society replicated the structure of the hierarchical patriarchal state, observes Christine D. Warbeck. Quote, women and children found themselves subordinated to husbands and fathers, just as peasants as a whole were subordinated to the Tsar, the Supreme Father. Unquote. The medieval family economic structure was a heavy yoke around the necks of all those who were not wealthy, landowning males. Author William M. Mandel wrote, quote, although the serfs were freed in 1861, they remained dependent upon and ruled by their former owners, in precisely the fashion of the black population of the American South after emancipation. Unquote. These oppressive conditions generated resistance. In a mass trial of 50 peasants, Narodniks, part of the populist movement, in 1877, 15 were women, 
Mandel describes them as populists who, quote, believed the solution to Russia's problems lay in that country's traditional peasant communes, freed, however, of landlord exploitation, unquote. He quotes Sofia Bardina, a 22-year-old defendant, who spoke eloquently from the docket about the need to abolish the patriarchal class structure of the family. She told the court, in words laden with sarcasm, quote, Nor do I know whether the family is undermined by that social order which forces a woman to leave her family and turn to the factory, where she and her children are inevitably corrupted, that order which compels a woman to become a prostitute because of her poverty, and which even sanctions prostitution as a legitimate and necessary phenomenon in every well-ordered state or whether the family is undermined by us, who are striving to eradicate this misery, which is the principal cause of all social calamities, including the destruction of the family. Unquote. Mandel recalled that the Russian writer Maxim Gorky was beaten almost to death by Cossacks in a rural village after he tried to save a woman who was being dragged naked behind a horse because she was accused of the, quote, crime of adultery. Quote, that practice did not exist in town, Mandel concludes. Part 8. Capitalism Shakes the Branches As city life and capitalist industrialization were shaking up family and sexual relations for Russian male workers, women also felt their impact. Historian Dan Healy wrote, quote, Same-sex relations between women in Tsarist and early Soviet Russia reflected the general transformation of women's roles and opportunities. For increasing numbers of women, the ties of the patriarchal village were loosening and breaking, and as with migrant men in the city, Links to family were not always sufficient to maintain traditional forms of surveillance, including the monitoring of sexual behavior, unquote. While capitalism shook the branches of this rooted patriarchal system, it left the trunk intact. That's such a good metaphor. Russian women were still weighed down with the burden of patriarchal family relations that served the class interests of the semi-feudal, semi-imperialist state. Laura Engelstein writes, quote, Imperial Russian law established a system of power within the family at least as autocratic as the one governing the operation of the state. The husband wielded absolute authority over the wife, and the father entirely dominated the children. Women could not leave their households or undertake paid employment without the formal permission of father or husband, who controlled their access to the necessary official papers. No law protected women against physical abuse short of severe bodily injury. Quote, no formal grounds existed for legal separation. Divorce, for which adultery constituted one of the few legitimate reasons, could be obtained only after elaborate and humiliating or duplicitous procedures. Annulment was a rare and arduous attainment. No one of any age, male or female, could marry without the permission of parents or other appropriate authorities. By ancient custom, women had the legal right to maintain their own property after marriage, but they suffered severe disadvantages when it came to inheriting family wealth." Unquote. Nadezhda Kripskaya, a Bolshevik leader and author of the pre-revolutionary pamphlet The Woman Worker, described company housing at the Thornton Broadcloth Mill, which, like much of Russian industry, was foreign-owned. Workers lived in, quote, a huge building with an endless number of rooms, the partitions not up to the ceiling. The din was ear-splitting. The walls were green with damp. There were two families in each of the rooms, which were not large. They dried their laundry in the room, and it was so stifling the oil lump sputtered. Dormitory rooms were terribly crowded. The working day was incredibly long, 12 to 14 hours at the textile mills. We saw some of the women workers lying on the cots in exhaustion, their faces in their pillows, unquote. Urban living also left its mark on the lives of male workers. Quote, the rapid expansion of Russia's industrial base was accomplished by large numbers of male workers living in cities where there was neither space nor money for the replication of peasant marriage and family patterns, Healy wrote. Quote, in Tsarist Moscow, working men in the sexually active younger age groups outnumbered women, and they were crowded together in accommodations precluding any possibility of starting families or bringing a wife and children from the village to join them, unquote. As peasants were pulled toward the vortex of urbanization in search of jobs, quote, a significant proportion of these newcomers stayed only temporarily or seasonally. Many left wives and families behind in the village, Healy notes. Quote, others settled and became the basis of an urban proletariat in St. Petersburg, Moscow, and a handful of other centers. Urban workers' housing was crowded. A huge proportion lived in barracks, flop houses, or shared rooms, and even shared beds. A significant percentage lived in employers' households and workshops. Quote, men found opportunities for sexual expression with each other in Russia's industrializing centers. As they exploited these new possibilities, 
they transformed Russian masculinity's traditional patterns of mutual male eros, unquote. That same sex eros, including, in some instances, lesbian love, was expressed eloquently in the literature and arts produced in the late 19th century by the radicalized intelligentsia that was funded and flourished in the battle of the rising bourgeoisie and their imperialist backers against feudalism. This articulation of the love that was finally speaking out in its own name flowered after the easing of censorship of books and periodicals following the 1905 revolution against Tsar Nicholas II. Two Currents in Women's Struggle The emancipation of women and the overall struggle for sexual liberation are closely tied, in particular because sexual subjugation in general is historically a key weapon of patriarchal domination. That connection was visible in the late 19th century as revolutionary activists established collective living spaces. These political revolutionaries, writes Mandel, quote, established communes in the largest cities that were, particularly for women, places of refuge for runaways from the patriarchalism of smaller towns or family estates, unquote. Mandel describes this collective living and the gender expression that was its hallmark in his own words, perhaps limited by his own concepts. Quote, the members of the commune shared money, food, and possessions. The women particularly expressed their contempt for existing society by violating its rules of dress. They wore their hair straight, their clothing severe and comfortable, glasses whenever they needed them, and particularly violated convention by smoking. A unisex effect was striven for, not in the wearing of trousers, which was unthinkable, but in the abandonment of everything that made for femininity and for regarding women as sex objects." Unquote. Between 1905 and 1917, two clear currents emerged in Russia that vied for leadership in the women's movement. One was socialist, seeking nothing less than the complete liberation of all workers and peasants from class domination. The other was a feminist grouping that was more middle and upper class in its composition and political orientation. It focused its struggle on the right to vote, an important bourgeois democratic demand. In December 1908, for example, the feminists organized a Russia-wide congress in which more than 1,000 delegates took part. Only 45 working women were present, and not one single woman from the peasantry, the class that represented Russia's vast majority of laborers. The revolutionary women's current looked very different. In 1913, the Bolsheviks organized an important first celebration in Russia of International Women's Day. Their organizing was in sharp distinction to a January Congress on Women's Education convened by liberal intellectuals, to which only a few women workers had been invited. The Bolsheviks knew that in the repressive political climate of that year, the police would not issue a permit for a demonstration, so they secured the grain exchange for a, quote, learned symposium. On the day of the event, March 8, the federal police, who were present at all meetings and could end any gathering at a whim, filled the first two rows in the hall. The speakers at the Bolshevik organized event were all women, working women. One of the leading voices at the meeting was a 25-year-old weaver who had been a member of her union executive board for six years. The weaver described the class composition and mood of the event, quote, No matter how poor the working women were, on their day, the first holiday of women in Russia, they put on the very best they had, and the packed hall looked like a meadow in May from the brightness of the colors. The police didn't succeed in spoiling our holiday, although every speaker had to get her most private thoughts across to the audience as though breaking through the alert silence of the first rows." Unquote. The outbreak of the inter-imperialist World War I in 1914 illuminated the bourgeois political foundation of those who identified with the feminist current. According to Richard Stites, a researcher in Denmark, quote, the feminists were rhapsodic about the great possibilities of serving the Russian fatherland, and in return, gathering political dividends for themselves. They showed no subtlety in connecting their, quote, sacrifices to eventual payment in the coin of women's suffrage, unquote. Stites notes it was not well-to-do movement women who did most of the sacrificing during World War I. It was the women and men of the laboring classes who sacrificed. And women workers paid with their sweat and toil, too. The percentage of women workers in the factories had reached 30% of the total when the war broke out. By 1917, as the imperialist war brought hunger and want, death and disability, thousands of women in the St. Petersburg needle trade walked out on strike, marching through the streets demanding peace, land, and bread. Male workers joined them, swelling the ranks of protest to 90,000. That strike broke out on March 8, International Women's Day, and it was the first shot of the anti-capitalist Russian Revolution. Capitalism's Historical Task Capitalism in Russia, 
like feudalism, relied on the patriarchal family structures as economic units. The rule of capital accumulation created its own superstructure of law, religion, politics, and education to justify the inequality of its economic base, and it enforced this economic and social injustice with brutal state repression. World War I, an outgrowth of capitalism's drive to expand its relentless search for profits beyond its own border, was also having a profound impact on patriarchal family relations. The war uprooted millions of peasants and workers in Russia and elsewhere, disrupting planting and harvesting, production and family reproduction. This clash of imperialist titans over who would steal the land, labor, and resources of colonized peoples only profited the imperial victors. The war was slaughtering tens of millions of laborers and oppressed peoples and exacerbating the super-exploitation and suffering of peoples caught in the grip of colonialism. Capitalism, in relation to feudalism, was a progressive force in that it was a superior economic system, a qualitative leap in human productivity. Capitalism eradicated much of the medievalism of feudal autocracy with its need for science and technological advance. Capitalism socialized the artisan's individual tools, forging them into massive means of production. It galvanized a working class. But the social relationship of capital, of exploiter and exploited, is a brutal one for workers and oppressed peoples. And capitalism in Russia was too weak and too subordinated to the existing imperialist countries to even fulfill its bourgeois democratic promises to the masses. The brief liberal capitalist regime ushered in by the February 1917 revolution solved none of their problems. It couldn't get out of the war that was killing the workers and peasants because the ruling class had imperial ambitions. It couldn't distribute the land to the peasants, and it couldn't meet the most elementary demands of the workers. Thus, the Bolshevik slogan of bread, land, and peace won the masses over to the need for a second revolution. And this revolution, in October 1917, created a worker's state that began the work of uprooting the entire trunk of ruling class economic structures. It was no accident that one of the first acts of the Bolshevik government was to abolish the czarist anti-gay and anti-woman laws. Section 9. Naysayers Poo-Poo Bolshevik Gains Simon Karlinsky, a Berkeley professor of Russian literature and drama, poo-poos the decriminalization of same-sex love by the young Russian workers' state in October 1917. Quote, The revolutions of 1905 and of February 1917, he writes, which brought unprecedented new freedom of expression for Russian gay and lesbian writers, are all too often conflated in Western minds with the Bolshevik-led October Revolution, routinely credited with the sexual liberation achieved by the two earlier revolutions, unquote. Karlinsky offers details about the public articulation of same-sex love in Russia's literary golden age in the late 19th century and its silver age in the early 20th century. He focuses in particular on the flowering of what today would be called gay and lesbian literature between 1905 and 1917. The most famous, of course, was the novel Wings by Mikhail Kuzmin, that swept the imagination of the male homosexual population because it was the first gay novel in European literature to end happily. Between 1905 and 1910, the publication of Lydia Zinovieva Annabal's novel 33 Freaks and her collection of stories, The Tragic Zoo, also electrified the public in general and lesbians in particular. The celebrated writer Nikolai Klyoev, leader of the so-called peasant poets, named for their class origin and for the theme of their writing, was also openly gay. I'll note here that Feinberg has been using quotations around gay and lesbian in this section, explained, using quotation marks around the words lesbian and gay is a reminder that modern identities are relative and not precisely adaptable to other historical periods, regions, nationalities, and classes. Russians have used different concepts to describe same-sex attraction, like blue or pink, or people of the moonlight, the title of a book by Vasily Razanov in 1913. From all this, Karlinsky concludes, and so do other anti-communist historians, that the revolution should have stopped in February 1917. Quote, Constantly sabotaged by the monarchists on the right and the Bolsheviks on the left, the regime managed to promote human rights and freedoms on a scale not experienced in Russia before or since. That was when women and minorities were given full civil and political rights, including the vote. Freedom of religion, speech, press, labor unions, and strikes became a reality. The prominent feminist Sofia Panino was given a cabinet-level post, and all vestiges of censorship were abolished. Unquote. 
Karlinsky concludes, quote, The seizure of power by Lenin and Trotsky in October 1917 was hailed by many then, and is often still regarded as an enhancement of the rights gained by the revolutions of 1905 and February 1917. But as far as rights, including gay rights and personal freedoms are concerned, the October Revolution was actually a reversal and a negation of the two earlier revolutions, rather than their continuation, unquote. Is that true? Those who wax eloquent about the bourgeois democracy that briefly flourished in 1905 and again in 1917 focus on the political freedoms incorporated in the laws of that time. But they omit that while political debate emerged and strikes may have become legal, millions of bellies were still growling for bread. Backs were bowed by dawn to dusk toil in fields and factories. Women were dragged by their hair to their patriarchal family roles. Young men and women, looking for same-sex love, lived invisible lives, ended up being marketed for someone else's profits, or forced to pay extortionists from their own pockets. Jews were forced to fight or to flee from pogroms. Even after the February Revolution, all this continued to be exacerbated by Russia's participation in the war, whose killing fields were drenched with the blood of millions of Russian and German laborers. The February 1917 provisional government, headed by Kerensky, was hoisted to political power by a groundswell of workers and peasants who yearned to throw off the yoke of class exploitation by rich landowners and factory bosses. They hungered for bread, land, and peace. But the provisional government was tied to Russia's weak capitalist class. They wouldn't give up the territorial claims that kept Russia in the war. They weren't for expropriating the bosses. They couldn't even carry out land reform. All that required another revolution, one that suppressed the landlords and capitalists. It came in October, under the leadership of the Bolsheviks. The communist revolution had to carry out the tasks that the capitalists and their government could not complete. In December 1917, only weeks after seizing state power, the Bolsheviks abolished the Tsarist anti-gay law, legalized abortion, provided maternity leave, lifted the onerous restrictions on divorce, and legally recognized children born outside of marriage. This act of expunging the superstructure of egregious laws was of a political character. It demonstrated the revolutionary direction and goals of the Bolsheviks under Lenin's leadership. However, these Tsarist laws had been a codification of the inequality that was institutionalized in the semi-feudal, semi-imperial class relationships in the economy and in society. So the revolutionary work of transforming the social structure had just begun, and that work was not unimpeded. It was carried out under fire from invading imperialist powers on 14 fronts. That's the end of the article. I just want to add for people who are still under the false impression that the short-lived, bourgeois-led provisional government, which was in place after the February 1917 revolution, which did get rid of the Tsar, anyone who thinks that that period was so great and, oh gee, you know, if only the bourgeoisie had been able to continue to set up their government, everything would have been so great, etc. There is a not very well-known piece by Stalin called The Plot Against the Revolution about the Kornilov Revolt and basically how the Kerensky government, that bourgeois-led provisional government, was plotting to impose martial law as part of their efforts to keep Russia in the war, which again, the bourgeoisie was not fighting and dying in. That was workers and peasants who were doing that. 